Welcome back to Nomad Boat Building. I'm Mark Rudin, and we're building the Catalina Wherry. Now today we're going to get into some lofting. Now just a reminder that lofting is a process of taking a scale drawing of a boat and using a set of coordinates that we call the table of offsets, redrawing it full scale on the loft floor. And the loft floor is literally that. It's either the wooden floor of a boat building shop, or in my case, I build a little platform in order to do this work on top of. Now I'm not going to cover the entire process of lofting because it is both lengthy and a bit tedious and very, very difficult to shoot. So what I am going to do is show you just a few aspects of it that I think people struggle to understand. Now part of the footage here was taken from a live stream I did on Instagram and that's why you'll see me looking off in some oddball direction. I'm looking at my phone rather than the camera. So with that said, sit back and relax. Now let's dig into a little bit about lofting. Yesterday I finished figuring out my um, my mold reductions for the boat here and I've got, done it on my mylar so I'm rather than do that uh, live because it's a bit lengthy and boring and hard to show I'm going to talk about the fundamentals behind doing that and how it works. So uh, when we build a boat and we want to make molds for it we want to reduce the dimensions of those molds by the thickness of the planking. And some people deal with that right off the bat by lofting to the inside of their planking surfaces. And I've done that, but I, I hate doing it because I get really screwed up when you get towards the, the stem, especially, and around the transom, trying to figure out how to loft to the inside, not knowing exactly how the outside's gonna look. Just, my brain can't go there. I, I much rather just sort of think about the boat as the outside skin and then worry about how to build everything inside of it. So I locked that way and as a result I need to figure out the mold reductions in order to make that happen, which is the, the payoff. So or 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 it's the penalty, I'm not sure which one it is. If you've got a long skinny boat, like a canoe or something, you can pretty much just get away with reducing the molds by the thickness of the planking. However, the more shapely your boat is, the more angle between the different stations, the more the relative thickness of those things, relative to the cross section of the boat, it, the, that dimension changes, if you can imagine. Um, if you can imagine you've got a, a cylinder here, we'll pretend this is a boat. Well, the stations, you know, towards the middle, there's very little difference in bevel between them. But as you get towards the ends, as that cross section moves towards the ends, it gets steeper and steeper and steeper and how thick that planking is relative to that cross-section changes. So we need to figure out how to do that. Here's the thing that really helps to understand what's going on with bevels. So we've got a body plan here. So these are the, the sections of our boat, cross-sections of our boat stacked on top of each other. And from, working from this, we can figure out what the bevels are. And here's the best illustration I can come up with. So I've got one section here and another section right here. So if I take this square and I put it up against one of the section lines and then I go up the length of the square the station spacing. So in this case it's two feet then add a straight edge to it and then we take that straight edge and we touch the next station and we're going square to the face of that station. Right here, this is the angle, the difference in angle between one station and the next. Right, so I could take like a bevel gauge. Come on, gotta work one handed again. Come on, open up there. So, so there you go. So that angle right there is the difference between one station to the next station. That's what we're trying to figure out. But, um, and you could certainly do it like this using a square and a pointer, but that's kind of awkward to do as you can imagine. So you, can, you just saw me fumbling around trying to work one handed. And I've thought about actually making a jig that does exactly this. Um, you could do it. And as we go to the next station here, that becomes steeper towards the midship of the boat, there's very little angle as you can see. It's getting closer and closer to plumb, as you would expect. Okay, so how do we do this in a simpler, 
way without farting around with this big construction here. And be able to visualize this is the key to understanding how this next little step works. So if you can visualize that, and I could not visualize that for the longest time until I found a book that actually illustrated that very thing I just showed you, this book by Ed Monk. And you can see right there is the illustration of that particular little example. With that in mind, I'm gonna direct you to another book. And while I like Howard Chappelle for almost all things boat building related, uh, the Goujon Brothers boat building manual here actually has got one of the best uh, lofting descriptions in there. So the next thing we think have to think about is this little protractor. So we call this a master bevel board and we would make one of these full size. And so what I want you to look at here is this little, this little stick right here. So we call this a bevel board. I make mine out of mylar. They suggest you make it out of a piece of wood that is cut to the same thickness as the thing that you want to reduce. So it, you're, you're planking, or maybe it's planking and battens. And in the case of this boat, I am reducing these lines by both the planking thickness, which is this little quarter inch square here, plus I'm gonna be using uh, a battens on my mold spanning, like marking out all the plank lines, and they're gonna stay on the mold through the planking process. So they're 5 eighths square, so I got 7 eighths of an inch that I need to reduce my molds. I could have just reduced them all by 7 eighths across the board, because it's not a real beamy boat. But for the hell of it, I like to go through this process, if for no other reason, just to remind myself how to go through it, because it's so easy to forget how to do the little bits and pieces of it. So this is a master bevel board. And the whole idea behind this is we use this as a tool to figure out what the various bevels are on our boat. And it's really just a very large protractor. It's not something you can buy, you've got to make it. And there's a system of layout for making it, which we're not going to get into right now. The key to using it is laying off your station spacing on the master bevel board. So we got a 24 inch spacing on this boat. So I put a mark there at 24 inches. And then it's just a question of drawing a perpendicular up that line. And these gradations, of course, go uh, from zero up through 45 and a little bit beyond. But we don't usually need to use them all that high. It all depends on the, the boat you're building, of course. And so now we take a piece of mylar. And you could do this with wood too, if you wanted to. I mean, I have a, a wooden master bevel board that I made back in boat building school that we use just as like a protractor to pick up bevels off of things and record them. So this is kind of like that. However, we use this a little bit differently and we use this in the locking process. So with that done, uh, now I just, have to spend a bunch of time drawing a whole lot of lines and we're basically tracing all these gradations and I like to use a different color at the five degree marks because I just find it much easier to figure out where I'm at quickly. And I've popped a nail in here at the center point or the fulcrum of this protractor. Now we're at 45. I'm not going to bother going any higher than that because I'm pretty positive I won't need it. Okay, and now the uh, next thing we do is we just fill in the rest of the gradations. And again, I'll just switch to another color. I'm going to use blue for these ones. And uh, I mean, it's it should be understood which edge it is you've set your protractor at because that's the edge you're going to work off of. I made this about three inches wide, but that's just because it's a convenient width of material to use in terms of like the piece of mylar. But the width that we really are concerned about is, is, the, is the thickness of planking or the thickness of frames or the combination of the two. In this case, I'm going to be laying off the thickness of my planking plus the thickness of some battens that I'll be applying to my molds in order to 
line out my planks. So I'm going to be using a battened mold for this project. What that means is that we apply a little square batten at every plank landing on both sides of the boat. And those battens both support the edge of our planking stock because it's light plywood. So it has a limited range of stiffness. And while we want it to be able to wrap around the boat, what we don't want is we don't want it sort of buckling in ungainly ways. And the plywood is not always super uh, cooperative that way. I mean, sometimes it has a natural bow to it in one direction or the other that can be fighting with you. Or as you're planing it, it may want to sag in between the molds. So in order to combat that, you got to have more molds, which takes a bunch of extra effort to build. So the battens is kind of a simple solution to, uh, to that problem. And it has the added benefit of giving us a, a method of trimming some of our planks to shape on one side of the planking as we, after we've hung it. So there's a, a bit of a time savings there. And this little device doesn't need to be massively accurate. But this will be fine, so we'll just give ourselves some numbers. And I'll write down what this is from. So this is the, the Catalina Wary. Okay. So the next thing we need to do is we have one edge that is our primary edge. And now we need to reduce our planking and mold thickness. So or in this case, it's going to be batten thickness. So we're going to do quarter inch planking plus, I was thinking I'm going to do a 5 8 batten. That's a nice strong, a strong plank lap. Usually plank laps are about twice the thickness of your planking. Um, half inch is, feels a little bit skimpy maybe. So I'm going to go to the top here now, mark my quarter and then mark my five eighths. So now we connect those dots. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna tell us what the true width of this combination of planking and batten is at any particular angle along the scale. So while it's 5 eighths plus a quarter inch at this end, which makes 7 eighths of an inch, by the time you get up here, up towards 45 degrees, the combination of those two comes up to an inch and a quarter. So that's a pretty big jump. Uh, so that's important to know because if we want to reduce our planking accordingly so that we keep the same finished lines, we need to know how much that changes over the length of the boat. Now one thing I could do, if I weren't using the battens, I would probably be inclined to just go ahead and just reduce all the molds by one quarter inch and call it good. But um, I'm not going to do that because I'm using the battens. I want to make sure that I uh, reduce it a bit more. Now the other flat side of the coin is you could just increase the size of your boat a little bit by adding battens to the outside of those finished lines. But of course, you're going to have to increase the width of your transom to compensate, and you got to think about the stem. So the stem width would have to increase to compensate for that too. And in order to get it to finish out at a nice fine point, it means that you probably need to put in a heavier cut water, or you need to do something to sort of compensate for that extra thickness. That is our uh, bevel board. So I'll trim this down so it's a bit shorter. We'll put away the master bevel board here. So there's two ways you can you can lay these out. One of them is laying them out from the uh, the fulcrum of that protractor out the station spacing distance, which I've done with this one. The other method is you go twice the spacing station distance and 
The only reason to go twice is because you can get a slightly better relative angle on the thing that you're measuring. So the way you use it is you basically take your little stick here and you lay it on your lofting. You put the zero degree end of it on one station and then you look over to the next station and you see where the angle crosses it. And of course you've marked out the numbers here. And so for instance, from my station three to station two at this point, I get what looks like uh, roughly uh, 10, 11, 12, say 13 degrees. That's the be bevel between those two stations. Using the other method, the longer, the double the station spacing, I would go from station four to station two, read that dimension, and that actually tells me the slightly more accurate dimension for station three. So in this case, it comes out at like uh, 10 degrees. So the difference is that when you use the single station spacing, I'm getting the distance between one station and the next. But when I use the double station spacing, I'm getting the what, sort of a, a mean or an average result between the three stations. It gives you a more accurate triangle. Let me try and clarify that a little bit better. So here's some lines for the one section of a boat. We'll just say there's the shear line here. The first method where we're measuring a bevel between one station and the next, we create a triangle that looks like this. So it's telling us what this angle is right here. The other method is where we go with double the station spacing. And it's giving us this angle here. So you can see how while this is accurate to a certain degree, this is giving us a better idea as to what this shape is relative to these two stations. Because we're trying to create a bevel that allows planking to lie across there. And so for that reason, using this double station spacing is slightly more accurate in some ways. It doesn't give us as accurate an idea as to what this individual triangle is, but this larger overall triangle is a little bit more accurate. We could do it mathematically by measuring this angle and that angle, and then figuring out what the mean is, but this is just a fast, simple way to get something that's close enough. So what those bevel boards are doing is they're measuring, in the case of the single station spacing, they're measuring this distance right here. And then telling us what, the, what this angle is between the two. And in the case of the double station spacing, it's measuring this distance right here and giving us what this angle is over here. So you can see they're relatively similar. Uh, I do use both methods. And uh, what I'll do is when I've got stations that are where I don't can't span three of them, like station four here is my outer board station. I don't have one further out to compare it to. I'll use the single station spacing. And where I can span three of them, I will use the double station spacing. There's a fudge factor involved because we're going to fare these things out once all is said and done. So getting those angles 100% perfect isn't 100% necessary. Now, why would you need the angles? Well, if you're doing, uh, say, sawn frames from these body stations instead of temporary molds, you'd want those angles. You want to know exactly what those angles are. If you wanted to be able to apply heavy battens onto them and not have them just bearing on one corner of your mold, then you want those angles as well. I'm going to just do squared off edge molds. It's going to be faster and easier and it's a pretty light boat and I'm not too worried about it. But knowing those angles can be important if you have an, an application for cutting all those molds to those angles all the way through the length of them. And, and we record those angles as we go. This kind of bevel board 
is something that we make when we're in boat building school and we make it the same way. We have that big master bevel board, we lay a piece of stick across there and we draw a bunch of lines and I don't even remember what station spacing this one was done at. It's a bit irrelevant what it, where it's done at. You do it whatever distance is convenient for the length of the board. Of course, the shorter the board, the closer you gotta to come to zero in order to fit the widest range of angles on. Woodpecker here has made a really nice little bevel board I don't, I don't know that these are still available, but they split the, the angles from zero to 30 degrees on one side, and then went, it went from 30 to 45 or so, or 55 on the other side. And they've given you uh, half degrees and quarter degrees in their, uh, in their markings. So that's pretty nice. I don't use this one as much because it's a bit heavier and bulkier, but, um, but you know, it's a great little tool. And so, in fact, I don't even use these much at all because I don't really record angles myself very much. Recording numerical angles is something that works great when you're working in a team and you want to call out an angle for something to somebody else, or you've got saws that are set up with protractors on them so you can re reuse those angles numerically, but I don't do that. I tend to just sort of do it by eye or I bring my, my my square over to the bandsaw and I set the bandsaw, whatever the square is saying. So I don't use that stuff as much. I think it's important to explain how we use this bevel board for reductions. So I've mentioned how to use it to determine what the angle is between one frame and the next. But to do the reductions, what we need to do is use these other lines that we've drawn on here. The first line we've drawn on is the thickness of the planking. And the second line we've drawn on is the thickness of the batten that I'm going to be putting over the molds. So we want to reduce the molds by this combined thickness of batten and planking. For instance, right here on this mold, we have angles of 15, 16 degrees. So we take our bevel board here and what we're essentially doing, if I pick up this angle here, say at 15 degrees, take that dimension, we carry it over here. That's our reduction. Now I don't use dividers to do this. I use the bevel board itself. I simply take this bevel board, lay it on my mold, wherever it might be, be the, the blue marks here, put the 15 degree on intersection on there, and I swing this line until it's perpendicular to the face of the mold. Up here it's 16 degrees, so I go to the 16, I line it up there and I make sure this line again is perpendicular to the mold and where the edge of this bevel board crosses this line I've drawn that's perpendicular, that's the reduction. So you can see at this end of the scale, the relative reduction is pretty straightforward. We're at zero degrees. We come up to the 15 and we make a comparison. And there's a little bit of a difference, not a lot, it's about six, a sixteenth of an inch perhaps. But as you can see, as you go higher and higher, that gets greater and greater. And if we're working on a very large boat, this reduction might not be seven eighths of an inch collectively, it might be an inch and a half or two inches if we're using heavy planking and big battens that wrap around the molds. So rather than just reducing all these molds by seven eighths of an inch, which I could do, I like going through this process because it helps remind me how to do the process. If I don't use it, I will lose it. Now, what, once you've got your molds figured out and your mold reductions done, then you need to try and transfer those uh, shapes to some finished wood. Now, I do mylars because I find it convenient and I like having the mylar to do the assembly on top of. But uh, there's another method. Uh, there's two other methods, really. One of them is just taking um, common nails and laying them flat along the board here. I don't use this method because it just feels a bit crude to me, but it's certainly doable. So you would take common nails and you would stack them up and tap the heads into the lofting board so that they're all sort of smushed in there with one edge of those heads protruding. And you take a piece of wood and you drop it on top and you stomp on it or tap on it with a hammer and you pull it off and there's all your markings. And I should probably try that. I don't know why I don't do it, but uh, I just never got into the habit of that. The other method is using lifting sticks. So with lifting sticks, you would take a mold here. So we'll just, you take a batten. I'm gonna just knock together this real quick.
Come on, it helps to call the same line mark. Okay, so you have your bundle batten. You wrap that around. And then we have a bunch of these things called lifting sticks. So there's not much to them. They got a little bit of a shape to them. And they've got to have a little throat here. You can see this and it's got a little, see that hole and a, and a cut? That's to allow these to spring open a little bit. So you want a really nice snug fit onto your bundle batten. And this, these two don't have the greatest fit. They're, they're okay, they're just, they're just there, but they, it could be a little tighter. So you would take a whole series of these, and I got, I don't know, a dozen of them or something like that. And you set these up like every four or six inches along that batten. Okay, then the other end has got a little hole in it. So you take a common nail, and you, you lock in that tail end there. And once you've got a whole bunch of these, it usually will hold the shape really well. You can pull these battens out, or you can pull these nails away from your batten, and then the whole thing is liftable. I tried it on here. I think my shape is just a little too small. These sticks are fairly long, and um, once I had it all sort of set up, this whole thing could sort of shift a little too much, and I, I had no way of sort of locking in the registration mark that I wanted. And so I lost my confidence that I was gonna get a, a good job out of it. So I abandoned it and decided to just stick with my Mylar system. But in theory, you would take a chunk of wood, you know, like so, you lift up that whole little affair, you slide that under, okay, and this is being held in shape, and then you just mark that piece of wood out right there, and that's your finished mold material. You take that away and cut it on the bandsaw. And that works great on a larger boat. It's a really good way to go. And in fact, what you can do is you can take all your little sections of material that are gonna be used in the final mold and you can stack them up with the, all the edges mitered together uh, so that they fit nice and tightly and then drop that on there, mark them all out, cut them all out and then reassemble them later on. I've certainly used it before, but Depends on the size of the boat. Uh, maybe I should probably just make some smaller lifting sticks. If I had lifting sticks that were like half this size, probably, that would have worked better. As it was, all of these guys were basically trying to crisscross right at the fulcrum here of these guys, and it just, it didn't work. It didn't work at this scale. Uh, so I finished doing the lofting on the Catalina. I was gonna do sawn frames at first. I decided I'm just going to plank this thing and worry about framing afterwards. I'll probably put them in at every station, I think, now. We'll laminate those frames up, but then we'll fit them into the boat so they'll go square to the planking face. They won't go square to, say, a, uh, the, the station spacing. Uh, so they're not gonna be like, one's not gonna be totally like parallel to the other. They're gonna be uh, kicked over at a slight angle relative to the lay of the planking. Uh, so we've got our patterns made for the uh, stem and the stern knee. We've got our pattern made for the stations and I've got our transom expansion done down there. That's all ready to go. I've got some nice materials for doing our molds. We've got this, I, I found at my local uh, hardwood supplier actually, they had a whole pile of this, um, this knotty pine, this tight knot pine, 12 inch width. So a lot of it was dead clear or very close to it. It's not pretty stuff though. It's got all this blue stain in it. So this is probably ponderosa pine, judging by the size. That's something we have a lot of in the interior. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll be using that for our stations. I've used it for the rib bands too, although the rib bands are I was having a hard time getting the rib bands dead fair. So there's a chance I might have to bite the bullet and buy some different material for those rib bands. I cut a bunch up. Hopefully it works out okay. I think it probably will. Anyhow, so that's it for today. Uh, we will be back with some, probably some mold making and some uh, making some stems and knees and all that sort of stuff. So, ciao for now, folks. We'll catch you later.